this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly to the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of, Adelaide, of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies from Councillor Mackey. And I believe Councillor Hyde might be running late. I think that's it, is that right? I now seek a mover and a seconder to move the minutes of the meeting the committee held the 20th of April and the reconvening meeting of the committee held the 27th of April 2021 be taken as read and confirmed as an accurate recording of the proceedings. Can I please have a mover? Councillor Canole, a seconder. Councillor Ho, is there, would you like to speak to this? Councillor Ho? And anyone else like to speak to this motion? No. Um, those in favour? Councillor Martin, yep. those against, and motions carry. Oh, wow. Members uh, and staff of the public gallery, welcome to the Free Council Discussion Forum Committee of the Committee. Um, this is your opportunity, members, to seek clarification on any of the items before you. Uh, you've all received the uh, email by our acting CEO. We're having a flexible discussion today, and please be refrained from entering any debates. We go to the first item, to item number 5.1, and we have Matthew, um, regarding the partial road closure of Cheshire Street. Do we have any questions or anything that you would like to discuss in regards to this item with Matthew? Yes, Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, a couple of quick questions. Um, what, it doesn't say in the papers, what length uh, is the agreement for Cheshire Street to be closed? Is it forever? or limited to 20 years, 30 years? Uh, through the chair, the road closure will be in place uh, for as long as uh, is um, indefinitely, unless there's change under the Roads Act. Okay. Um, and um, I, I note that neither SAPOL nor any of the emergency service agencies have responded to any of our correspondence to ask what they think of it, uh, but we're being asked to approve it. Do we think we should wait and what they have to say or read and see what they've got to say? Uh, through the chair, that isn't unusual. So generally, uh, we will put the information out to SAPOL and other agencies. Uh, if they have an issue, they generally come back to us. Uh, if not, um, they, uh, it's, it's deemed as appropriate and we, we move on. Okay. And just one uh, question, the papers don't make clear. It says the R boards, um, uh, the beams will be uh, replaced. But it doesn't say with what. Is it timber, metal, plastic? Uh, through the uh, chair, that will be decided as part of the engineering detail that comes through as part of the project. There'll be a full engineering approval requirement for this as part of the deed of agreement, uh, and that will be structurally assessed as part of that approval process. And, and will they be covered with vines, or um, it doesn't say that? You've got vines there. Mm -hmm. Again, through the chair, I think it was quite clear from the presentation uh, that the intent of the area is to have it as a uh, festive space or a, a space that uh, can be used for outdoor photography, particularly with the um, births, deaths and marriages and the marriages component in particular. So the intent is to beautify that space. Um, so the idea of the arbor would be to retain that um, and put that back over the top of the new um, the new structures. Okay. Doesn't say that, it doesn't say that though. And the um, the materials of the arbor are important to whether I like it or I don't like it, and the vine covering to reflect the history of the um, history of the street is important to me. I like the um, presentation, but it was assumed that they were wooden. Um, and that it would be fine. I'm not saying that's a. Uh, I, I, I can't say yes or no. But until I, know, I don't want some engineer go, as we did on the Zoo Bridge, let the engineers sign off it. It's completely different. It's important that we see what it's made of and whether there'll be plants over it. It can't be left to, to, to an engineering board. 
So can we get that information before we vote on it? Uh, Clinton, do we get any information with Councillor? Mm -hmm. I mean, it might not make anybody else, but I care about whether it's a vine covered street. I care whether they're good. I care whether it's natural. And I think we know that we do. Mm. Um, thanks, Councillor, for the question. Through the Chair, um, tonight we're dealing with the Section 32 partial road closure, but I, I think if the if there are any material changes to the um, Arbor Councillor, I think we would be bringing that back um, to advise Council of, of any um, requirements to change the Arbor. At this point in time, um, we're working with the existing Arbor to see if that is, is fit for purpose and can be incorporated into the new design. So, but what, but what, just what if it's not fit for purpose? What if it's not incorporated? I see these things get away from us really fast. Yep. Um, I, the partial road closure, I know that's what we're dealing with yep. tonight, but it's contingent upon what's going there. You know, if something awful is going there, that's quite different from, and, and this won't be completed to a term of next council probably completely, and then the, the decision and what we approve will be lost in the midst of time. So can we get that back to, can we get, is it written that it's a, a replaced by a vine arbor, if the vine, ever, because remember they've already removed a lot of it. Um, last council term was chopped down, so there's not um, much left. Th through the chair, I'm, just quite, more detail. I'm quite happy to take that undertaking and, and, and bring it back okay. through yeah. council if there's any We are changing over a public street and we've all got an image in our mind of a vine covered avenue. Now that might be quite different from what we end up with, so we've got to lock it in. Can we just have a clarification from McClinton what the undertaking will be um, in regards to this? Uh, through the Chair, I will undertake to um, bring a report back to Council should there be a requirement to materially change the arbour as it's currently, as so it currently we've, stands in Australia. So we've got an agreement now with them, it's written down somewhere yeah. mm. that it's a wooden arbour with or something. It's a steel with, arbour, but yeah. Uh, I, oh, if, so, if, so it's not just up to you, so it's a steel arbour. It's currently a steel arbour. Is that arbor. what it's currently? Yeah. Current, so is that going to be replaced with steel? It, it may be refurbished, it may be replaced. What I will do is, is undertake to come back to Council if it needs to be materially changed. So if it needs to be replaced, oh, I'm happy to come so back with that so information. So materially changed from what's there now? From what's there now. Ah, okay. Correct. Yeah, okay. yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Just following on from Councillor Moran, the other discussion that we had when we first saw this was around uh, the, the vine cover. And I agree with Councillor Moran, that was something that we, in our previous discussion, we were all very keen to make sure that that um, vine cover continued or was replaced if it was removed in the work. So um, is can we have that covered off in some way, Clinton, that um, we make that part of what we're asking for? Through the chair, yes, we can. And um, we, it, if work has to be done to the arbour, which we think it does, there will need to be some trimming and pruning of the vine Absolutely. to access the arbor to be able to undertake that work. Even if it's just painting, we will need to trim um, the, the vine to do that. But the absolute intention is to keep the vine structure in place and keep the, the majority of the vine structure healthy so that it can then grow in the future and actually create that um, shaded area, which is the whole intent of the project. Anyone else? Councillor Connell? So we are talking about what we had at the workshop and that if it's going to change from what we saw in the workshop and the, and the, uh, the information that provided us at the time, then obviously that will come back to us. Otherwise, it's still theoretically we, can, we won't expect any surprises. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 5.2, the Site for the City Beach. I believe that we have Christy presenting this item. Excuse me, before we start, is, is it the netball, the City Beach netball we're talking about, yeah. is it? Oh, no, no, we're talking about the City Beach volleyball. Yeah. So, because there is a city, it's a, it's misleading. Well, you know, I've got here a site for the City <coughs> Beach online. Yes, um, and there's a City Beach that happens once a year down on Pinky Flat. It has nothing to do with volleyball. Twice. 
That's oh, sorry, Dr. Chair, that was. So, um, so we're not talking about that. No, we're not talking so, about the renewal no, essay that so we're talking about city, on the beach, city beach, 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 temporary one year annual activation. I thought we had approved another city beach event. No? Good. Okay. Um, so, city beach site for the city beach volleyball. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any questions in regards to this? Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, look, um, the document for a five says that volleyball SA was supporting the, the, the three sites, but the site listed is the preferred site of the city of Adelaide. So what, what did volleyball SA want? Uh, through the chair, um, so volleyball SA board met, uh, it was after or just before the um, Parklands Authority meeting, so at the time of the report, we had actually landed on a specific site. Um, from the board of volleyball SA, but since then they have confirmed that part 27 is the preferred option. Okay. And just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, the 12.4 says um, this plan will actually be not only for volleyball um, SA, but we're going to create new sporting facilities for seven aside soccer and other things. Who or what is the driver of that? Because it's a big piece of land. I mean, it's uh, 750, 800 square metres, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, through the chair, so that's just to provide um, some diversity of the offering so that it's more of a year round offering than just beach volleyball. Um, so it's purely a proposal, and we can sort of take that feedback from council as to whether you think that's appropriate or not. Okay, and um, I, I know the environs are also under consideration for place of courage uh, to the right of the proposed volleyball site. Um, and in the sketch provided, the car park is at, actually to the left. And I'm just wondering why we wouldn't flip it to the right so that it provides, indeed, in the event of the place of courage going ahead, provides uh, joint access. Yeah. Through the chair, I'll take that on notice and consider that uh, in the totality, but at the moment, um, yeah, there would be a short walk over to the place of courage. Uh, yeah, or you'd have to park miles away and, and walk there. But if we've got a car park, at least when it's not in use by volleyball, it could be used in. Yeah, yeah, but that seems to be the access point there. It's just one moment, sorry. I think uh, Tom, you want to respond to that? Thank you, President Member. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I think uh, Council will have the opportunity because volleyball is they need to come back with a concept which will talk to design layout and use, and that will be subject to a council decision because uh, if we do progress, we would be entering into a lease agreement. So that's an ample opportunity for council to, to look at that. And that is the next question. Um, nothing happens until they've got the dough and enter into the lease. Okay, thank you. Great. Anyone else? In regards to this, Councillor Knoll? <coughs> I mean, it's, it's, as a site, yes, I think it's quite uh, useful, but all right, so we have vehicles on there now. Uh, so in the, in the thought process of, of this, uh, what is it around these vehicles where you think they're going to go or whatever, just because they need to go somewhere or, or whatever, so what is the expectation that's going to happen? And just to make sure that we're thinking about that in the process. Thank member. Thank you for the question, Councillor. First of all, to make Council aware, actually what we're trying to do is minimise vehicles on the parklands. So that's really important. Any only vehicles that we're uh, contemplating around that site is in support of uh, the activity. Um, that space uh, was the old netball courts and it has transitioned into a parking area. Um, but the reality is I would prefer people to park within the CBD and whatever and use our car parks and whatever. But however, we will look at it. Uh, but uh, there is another car park contained within that park closer to the play space. Thank you, Nath, for the questions or discussions on this item. Okay, we'll move to the next one. 5.3, we have uh, Tennis SA uh, in the Sunken Show Court. And still with you, Christy. So I'm open to any questions or discussions on this item. Councillors? All straightforward? All happy? 
Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so let's like pass this one in. 5.4, we have the Eliminate Adelaide Public Artwork. Again, Christy. Any discussions, questions, Councillor Pernod? Um, the, the artwork there on, uh, on Grove Street, I've, I've just have uh, a bit of a concern of the positioning of it because of the, uh, the proximity towards one of the main entrances and forklifts and things like that. So just as a concern that, you know, to make sure that uh, it, it isn't going to get damaged from the activity there because it, uh, forklifts do tend to uh, be a bit of a problem. Thank you, President Member. Thank you, Councillor Canal. Uh, yes, we've uh, certainly considered that with ECMA, um, and naturally we're very conscious in regards to the interactions with forklifts, and we're currently working with it. However, we are limited in regards to the services that are contained underground, and we believe that we'll be able to make sure that that sculpture and the forklifts are protected both ways. Councillor Keogh. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, look, I know this is all in train and that's all good, but I have to preface my question by stating that I'm not a particular fan of the existing artwork on Bank Street. Um, so I find it personally uh, sort of cold uh, and dispiriting. Um, but be that as it may, the location on Grove Street, it, it's a rhombohedron. We, it was hard to get a sense of what the final product would look like. Uh, there's all these references to other uh, works by the artist. Is there, does it approach a curve? Is, there, is it closer to a curve being a more multi polygon item than the Bank Street object, or is it very similar? Uh, is it very similar to, to Bank Street? Through the chair, it's very similar. It's, a, it's called an obtuse golden rehub. Yeah, So it is very similar. It's a different piece, so it's not entirely the same, but uh, it's, a, it's a matching piece. Okay, I thought I figured as much as a commonality with this works. Um, once this is there, I mean, I, I just you know, the arches uh, on Grove Street, the heritage arch. I just think that artwork may not be the greatest, greatest thing there, but um, what do I know? Um, look, um, uh, well, Phil, Phil sure, chime in with his artistic uh, critique in just a moment. Um, once this is there, will we, once this is there, given the repetition of this particular artist's work, will we have hit a saturation point for Jason Jason Sims artworks. Hopefully, at this point. <laughs> yeah, saturation too. I don't think it does that at this point. Um, <laughs> well, take, take it as a comment. <laughs> um, and I'm, I apologise if it's in the report. I did look for it. I couldn't find it. This is going to the, be unveiled during Illuminate. And um, do we have any sense of when? That might be happening. Yeah, no, I mean, so, you through the that? chair, yes, it's on. It's on the last day of Luminate, on the last Sunday, so it's their final moment. Thank you. I'm, I'm confused. Um, there's the Bank Street one, which we um, budgeted for in the current financial year, and where uh, that one's already up. And, that was 300,000 plus contingency, I think. Is that correct? No. No? So it's Grove Street, a new one? It, it was in the budget, yeah. It's a bookend. Okay. But there's an allocation in the draft budget as well. So this is the one we're talking about. So what yes. we're talking about here is not the Bank Street one, which is fully funded, but a brand new one in Grove Street coming out of the draft budget, and this is the mechanism to make it happen. Tom, do you present, member? Uh, just a response. It is uh, fully budgeted within this year's budget. Uh, I think what uh, we've got uh, a budget allocation in the draft budget, subject to council consideration. But I'll pass over to Christy in regards. To Thank you. Uh, through the chair, this is simply for noting this is an artwork that's been in train from the last budget. This is simply because it's over $100,000, so we're bringing public art back for noting. So, um, uh, just to help me, um, it, is that 400000 for the two or more? Through the chair, this is a $300,000 project plus some contingency because of the time frame and other things indicated in the report. 
Uh, however, um, it's just for this particular piece for the uh, Illuminate permanent public artwork. And next year, if you approve the budget that's currently out for consideration, there will be a new piece of public permanent artwork for next year's Illuminate Festival. So, and look, I'm sorry to be dense about this, but the two the two pieces by what's his name, Jason yes. Sims, are uh, bookends, and it's the one project. Yes. And it's the one project, four hundred thousand or four lot. Uh, uh, through the yeah. chair, the first piece was included in the market to Rebecca and is budgeted and finished through that project. This one was a piece of work that wasn't yet complete and was able to satisfy all of the conditions of a permanent public uh, artwork that was uh, well, illuminated and therefore we decided to complete it for this particular festival. And, and, it's, uh, a separate, it's a separate... Uh, no, okay, festival. and our contribution to the next festival will come next to that. So, um, can I just ask, I mean, this is a fairly, I mean, I know it's public art as well, but it's a fairly big contribution to Illuminate. How does this three, four hundred thousand dollar annual expenditure compare with, say, what we give to the Adelaide Festival or the Adelaide Fringe? See ya. Uh, thank you uh, to the chair. So members will remember last year, I think the Premier went to Council asking for Council support for um, a new winter festival, um, a three year um, from memory commitment um, for a multi-million dollar winter festival. Um, and at that point, the uh, sponsorship funding um, that Council would normally use uh, to allocate um, its contribution to large festivals is pretty much fully allocated and the discussion was that perhaps council's contribution could be um, an ongoing permanent piece of art that supported each iteration of Illuminate. So obviously that's an annual decision that council makes as part of its budget process. Um, so I guess of, I'm asking how does that it's very, it's different. Uh, sorry, in terms of whether it's um, similar in quantum to a fringe or a festival, the intent of those funding um, allocations are obviously quite different. So yeah. one is sponsorship, which has a whole heap of different requirements. This um, there's a legacy piece of public art on permanent display in the city. Yeah, I understand that, but I guess what I'm asking is, it was determined that instead of sponsorship, we would support through the installation of public art, and therefore that support. So I'm asking, how much do we contribute to the fringe of the festival compared to Illuminate? Because we're giving them 400,000, 300,000 each year so far. What does that compare to the festival, for example? Uh, thank you. I don't have those numbers with me, Councillor. Um, but from memory, I think the festival is around, say, 310, 320 per year, plus additional um, opportunities such as the Rundamore Dolls House installation, which would be a separate um, allocation of funding as well. So, so it's about the it, same. Well, it could be different ebbs and flows depending on um, what the priorities are. I'm not being critical, I'm just I trying to understand. And I don't have those numbers at the moment. That's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot, of, it's a lot of money when compared to what we give the fringe and the festival. I'm the best team on the artwork now. Anyway, uh, any other questions? Um, discussion in regards to that? Okay, thank you. Uh, go to the next item, PowerPoint 5. The City Connector Deed of Agreement. Thank you again for this one. Any questions or any discussions in regard to this item? If there isn't any, I will move on. So I will suggest if anyone has got anything they want to contribute to this item, last call. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, 5.6. <laughs> Heritage Strategy and Action Plan. <laughs> we have Michelle for this item. Again, I will ask uh, members if they've got any questions or any items of discussion in regards to this one. I will move on if we don't. Is yes, Councillor. Yeah. Is, is what, what, I'm not interested in the plan, I'm sure it's going to But is, is the uh, financial... Uh, sorry, Councillor Moran, if you're asking, uh, just, if you're having a question or discussion, could you put your microphone on? Is the money the same? 
uh, through the chair, yeah. there's no plans through this to change funding to any existing heritage support that we provide, whether that's the Heritage Festival that's on now, or the Heritage Incentive Scheme, or, or any of that advice. We so so worst case good. scenario, status quo. No that's reduction. Councillor Martin. Um, and just um, uh, two observations, if I may. I mean, it's a fine policy document and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I just wonder whether we can have um, some sort of protocols internally so that we don't fall into the trap of offending our own policy, such as uh, the mistake we made with SANS and Google earlier this year, where it was the minister who came forward and said, let's save this great site, um, when in fact we should have been at the foreground uh, of that battle. So if we, we can have some sort of internal checklist so that there are bells that ring whenever you know there's a proposal with which we're associated for redevelopment or whatever, which may affect a heritage list of property, that would be a really good thing. And Tom would just like to... Uh, yeah, sure. Through you, Deciding Member. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, there is a process in place when it actually went through development assessment. Our development officers actually made comment through to SCAP the whole way through the process, talking about the significance of that structure. So that was probably one of the things that actually prompted the Minister to take heed as well, because SCAP actually noticed it. Um, and we actually spoke to the developer as well in regards to that was one of the things that we wished to progress. Um, if you remember, I probably relayed that on to you when we were doing Zoom meetings a lot of months ago. Um, so actually we did address it very early in the case. Um, well, look, uh, there were confidential meetings. I'm bound by confidentiality, but that's not my recollection, but thank you. Um, and the second thing is, can we, um, uh, can we do something about putting on the agenda, and I know it's not in the policy and we're concentrating on um, you know, world heritage listing and so on, but state heritage listing is the one thing that is missing from the whole of our intent about the park and, and, and it would be great if we could put that firmly on the agenda. Thank you. Um, so we can probably answer that right now. We'll actually get um, Rick to come up in relation to that matter rather than no, a briefing. Okay. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, in relation, I think you're talking to um, the state heritage listing of the parklands and city layout. Um, there is an action in the action plan to um, advocate and, and support that proposal. Um, council, st uh, sorry, council staff are actively involved at the moment in supporting that project to to the end. As in with the, the, with the state government? Yes, yes. So. We, there has been a resolution of the State Heritage Council that Park and City Layout does meet the criteria for State Heritage Listing. It is at a point now where it's working through how best to do that and fit it within the planning system. So we are involved in those discussions. And can I ask you a question? Is, is um, that in here? I didn't see that State Heritage recommendation, uh, the, no, the, the document that you referred to. Sorry, that's not referenced. Um, Please tell me if I'm wrong. I'll see if Trace can find it while I forget. There is a, certainly an action. Yeah, I know, but there's no reference to it. Uh, there may not be direct reference to the decision of the council to support other things in there to support progressing that nomination. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just as a comment, um, the advocating for the state heritage listing is also part of the Parklands Management, uh, Parklands Authority Strategic Plan. Um, so that's been a piece of work that's been ongoing um, to support that state heritage system as well. Good. Well, good. Good. Thank you. Um, I, we're moving on to item 5.7. Um, we've got the review of your say. Um, so we have Matthew um, presenting this item. So if you'd like to have your say about your say, please do. Um, do I have to register? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, 3.5 says that 
this review concluded social media, well, this and others, uh, social media is the preferred method to be informed of engagement opportunities. Um, what, uh, what is the empirical evidence for that? Matthew? Uh, thank you, through the Chair. That was um, something that was brought up during the review that was done by Goldthorpe. Um, so the, the attachment that was attached to the um, yeah. response, yeah, that was through the engagement that was undertaken through Goldthorpe. So it was just Goldthorpe's? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, I'd say that, I'd say that I... Councillor Martin, is your microphone on? Sorry. That was when I was asking you a question, oh, but okay, I can sorry. put it back on if you'd like. <laughs> Um, and uh, in respect of um, 24 to 29, which deals with binary questions, um, uh, which in my appraisal of what's being said here is that um, the administration's saying that they're, they're not a problem uh, and that there are always opportunities for answering after binary questions in boxes to provide other uh, points of view. But I'm, I'm mindful of occasions like um, when uh, there was a proposal to give the Aquatic Centre to the Adelaide Crows, we did a consultation, and we asked people uh, a whole series of questions like, do you agree, do you agree strongly, do you disagree, do you disagree strongly? And the complaint was, even though it wasn't entirely binary, that people might have said, I agree if you did this, I disagree if you do that. Uh, and that is the point about binary questions that I've been trying to push through this. And, and it's just not acknowledged in this review. Um, people will always have views um, which are qualified. And when you do the agree strongly, disagree strongly or whatever, you don't give that fine grain uh, response the opportunity to come forward. And uh, that was the, uh, the only comment I had on that is administration want to speak to it, that's fine. And um, 1.6, um, uh, which is detailing the motion uh, at page 78 of the Court, Mr. Council, um, asked for options in the marketplace. And as far as I can see from page 81 on, the administration is saying we're not going to do that. Uh, now, why, why does the administration have such a closed mind on that? That is telling us what's in the marketplace. Not not making a recommendation, but just saying, look, you know, this one's out there and it sings and dances, and this one has flashing lights, and um, this one does that. It just says we're not going to do that. Point of the exercise. I think the, uh, what we were trying to um, get across in response to that question was that the current I am roadmap is a system that we have in place for assessing those systems and we're certainly open to um, tools for engagement and happy to look for those. Um, the current um, approach to the roadmap being that, that risk-based approach to the prioritisation of our systems um, and, and therefore the due diligence applied to that, that product selection is something that we're happy to look into in, in the future. Um, that currently hasn't come up on the timeline for the roadmap. Um, but that's certainly something that we are we are open to. I, um, and, and look, I'll leave it there, uh, Chair. But I mean, that that is what the motion says: six options for alternative consultation processes available in the marketplace, not qualified by if it's in our roadmap or um, anything else. But anyway, all right. Um, look, just a, a quick comment before I finish. Um, this, this is. Um, um, a bit disappointing, I'm sorry to say. I mean, I'm happy to see that we've traversed the ground, um, but it, w it would be good to look at how we might be able to improve the tools of communication. I acknowledge it does talk about changes to some of the questions and changes in the way uh, we do some of the things, but all in the context of your say. And, and an examination of other options might have at least put something on the table, even if it wasn't recommended we adopt it, that might provide some light about the way ahead. Um, and, and I acknowledge also the uncertainty about the changes to uh, legislated minimums under the Local Government Act reforms, but this is actually about communication with our ratepayers, not meeting uh, minimum standards. 
So um, yeah, it's uh, too late, I suppose, but anyway. Councillor Donna. Thanks. Um, I understand your say has recently had some updates, some upgrades to the service offerings. Just wondering if you've had a chance to have a look at those and see if any of it address any of the issues that have come up. We actually have a meeting coming up with our your say provider and we'll be talking through those with them in the next few weeks, actually. Okay, thank you. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, well, that's interesting. I've never liked you, your say. Um, I'm not particularly. Um, cognizant in this area and I didn't understand one word you said. Um, however, I've watched people, my children who are computer savvy in that area and my husband and the number of the expletives and the final giving up is is a common event and these are clever people. And when I draw not during the election, um, it is one thing that comes up over and over again. So I don't know who moved the motion, but I was very glad that we had a certain unanimity in this council that your say was falling short. Um, and I, I, I shudder to say that social media is the preferred method to be informed of engagement opportunities. Well, a lot of people, particularly in residential areas, aren't on social media. So you're missing a whole group of people. Uh, and to say that's a preferred method, I'd need some stats to prove that. But I think most importantly, as Phil pointed out, we weren't asked to improve your say or suggest improve. You were asked to go out and give us what else is out there that we could see if there's a better one. Your say has been a failure and it hasn't worked and our residents hate it. Our business people will not use it. And this is coming from people that door knock and ask them, are you satisfied with your say? And they're not. We get a very low turnout. We don't communicate well, so perhaps next time we could listen to the motion and go out there and actually do what the motion asked to do. See you. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, there's multiple aspects to how we engage and consult with our community. Your say is just one element of that. So I'd encourage council members to um, take a broader view of how we engage, whether it's um, you know, on a small scale, you know, planting arrangement for the East End where we would do a lot of face to face consultation and engagement, or whether it's a large scale statutory required engagement, um, such as business plan and budget. Um, the level of engagement we receive from our community um, does obviously depend on the content and the level of feeling within the community regarding a certain topic. So, um, Council Moran, you remember for many years we've tried numerous different ways to try and engage our community on the business plan and budget. And usually the only time there's um, a, a volume of responses is when the council makes a decision that the community does or doesn't like, such as cut a community bus or, you know, um, do a project that they're not really supportive of. Um, so I'd encourage you just to look at your say as just the um, mechanism through which we collate and capture data and information, not as the only way in which we do communicate and engage with our community. I'm happy, based on the feedback tonight, to um, work with Matt in the coming months to certainly look at um, different tools if it's a lack of trust in the tool itself, but certainly when it comes to the methodology, um, you know, I, I, I think we do on the whole uh, try to make sure that we engage in through the right mechanisms depending on, um, on what the project or the questions are. Thank you. Can I just come in on the big things though, like the bus, our budget and the aquatic centre, we use your say and it's very important in all this that we get get the, the true feedback, not the binary questions. And the, I mean, I'm just saying there was a big pushback against your say. I'm not just speaking for myself. It was, it was deemed very unsatisfactory for the engagement of those important. We do it beautifully with the Lord Mayor's letter and people's letter boxes about the you site and blah, blah, blah. That, that, that's different. But the biggies go into your say and people want to engage with your say. And it may be the best one out there. I mean, there may be a generation that just can't cope with that on sort of online consultation. And maybe it's just the questions we ask are bad. 
Um, but it, I want, would like, just like to know if there's what, what else is out there. It's a bit like the EPAS system for the hospital. I don't just trust the one that we've got. I want to see what else there is because you can waste a lot of money on a bad system. Anyone else? All right, thank you. I'll we'll move on to item 5.8. Uh, we have Sean to present on the 2021 quarter three commercial operations report. Sorry. So I'm opening up uh, members to any questions or any, any discussions in regards to this item. Um, can I just uh, thank the administration uh, of OK um, for putting this much in the public realm? Um, uh, I know that there's a deal of information that's still held back, although not a lot, not a lot. Um, most of it is out there, and I think it's an important thing. It inspires confidence in our um, commercial activities that great players can see what we're doing. Um, I had a couple of questions in relation to things that were said. There's a reference at page 88 to our income being affected by ad shills. What, what's that about? It's the last year. Yeah, no, but what was the impact to our revenue? Mm -hmm. Through the chair, so that's the arrangement that we have for um, advertising on the yeah, shelters, yeah. Um, and uh, through a result of COVID and those types of things, there was a negotiation process um, to work out how we navigated the pandemic in the relation to advertising of that nature really not being viable. Um, so it's just an adjustment as a result of that. So I just wanted a uh, reduction because of the. Yeah, the and then we can all that. Yeah, yeah, through the chair, I think a lot of contracts, I guess, got tested um, around how the clauses really worked in mechanics. So that's probably um, yep. the best answer I can give. And, and uh, town hall is <coughs> mentioned in there, um, along with the return of the ASO as being one of our saviors, but with significantly reduced numbers. Now, um, it th doesn't make it clear, but I'm uh, guessing it's inferring that's the restrictions on density, or is that just that the ASO doesn't seem to pull as many people as it used to? What were the last restrictions? Yeah. The restrictions. Uh, would you like to answer that? Yes, through the chairs. Generally, the restrictions. So, uh, what is that? I mean, you know, compared to a full house, to what they can now safely. Uh, so, through the chair, um, the current restrictions have most of the areas being at full capacity at the moment, but with um, social uh, with, with masks. Um, so that's more of a recent development, I believe, uh, in the last couple of months that that's been um, lifted. So I guess, um, yeah, as we go through potentially some other changes. So they still possible. have to wear masks for AS? If it's a full capacity. Okay. Oh, well, that'll stop them. Coming, won't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And look, um, and just in conclusion, can I say that I'm just delighted uh, to see the uh, Aquatic Centre performing better. But uh, we say the easing of restrictions has allowed school school carnivals at page 90 but i'm hearing that um, uh, the south australian primary schools association i think it's called sapsa um, has moved away from the aquatic center that is to say they are preferring uh, norwood marion and other places uh, are we saying that we can do it or that they are coming along and um, having school carnivals through the chair, my understanding is that um, the or originally a lot of the carnivals were very challenging because of the limits that were placed on it. I don't um, specifically have an answer to the one that you've referenced there, but um, certainly it was challenging in this in the aspect of um, the centre's cap and the number of participants. So definitely the large ones were being restricted. Um, those have lifted and we're able to basically facilitate the, the normal amount. Um, so moving forward, we would be available, the, the, the service would be available to those that would like to take it up, I think is probably the key point. Okay. Um, and Chair, if I could just conclude by saying it really is an outstanding result because uh, publicly the aquatic centres had an awful bashing. Um, we had one councillor proposing it closed down immediately in January, I think it was, and that has an immediate impact on memberships and the like. And we, we've just recently taken away the maintenance money for it, $10 million cut from it, and yet, yet people are still turning up. And I believe we're stopping the maintenance on it, but I think oh, yeah, capital. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the boiler room and that sort of stuff. Well, I don't believe that we're cutting 
Well, that's going would you have to talk? Would you like to clarify that? Sorry, Member, I think the motion that we had to say went up is going okay. into years four onwards. That maintenance is currently being undertaken. I'm, as I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Tom, can you just repeat that, sorry? Sorry, Councillor, just in response, maintenance and activities in relation to the asset continues. I think there was a motion on those that suggested looking at capital from years four to ten. However, I can reassure you that money has been spent on the centre. Mm. I understand that, but the, the budget allocation in the long-term financial plan until last month was 16 million, and we have shaved 10 million plus off that. Is that correct? Very precise, member. That was a decision of council in regards to that. Um, however, as you're probably aware, councillor, we're working very closely with uh, other government agencies to to seek funding. So uh, I think, uh, in essence, what we're trying to do is actually to attract that funding towards the centre. But you're indeed correct. There was a reduction in future capital. But again, that was a council decision. No, no, that's fine. And, and it goes to the point I'm making. That is that the centre and its attendances are resilient in the face of what is a sustained uh, attack on any future it has. Thank you. Mm. So what we've, we've shaved, sorry, I didn't start past me down the last council, we've shaved $10 million from the budget that was going to be for the centre. I, th I think service? what you're referring, oh, I think not to confuse it, I think Tom explained it, the upgrade, any upgrades on it with capital expenditure in regards to the facility has been shaved, but the property, the, the centre will continue to be maintained um, and uh, and safe for people to use. Well, so, I, I challenge that because um, we have caught, the whole thing is it rebuild now, it's not a matter of keeping the grouting in the tiles on an up to up to up to standard aquatic centre, and if you don't understand that, that's very sad. So when I left the council meeting, we had 16 million dollars in the um, in the notes, uh, and I understand Alex Hyde at one o'clock in the morning rolled out about 20 changes and one of them was knocking $10 million off an ageing past its date aquatic centre. I am horrified. Tom, I think you need to clarify that again. No, I don't want Tom to I clarify it. I, I think you and Tom are talking about the finances, as he said. I it think was there's a, a difference it between council expenditure. It was an administrative. Sorry, I'm still speaking. Tom made Excuse it very me. clear Council that it's an administrative, not an administrative decision, it's a council decision. So therefore, when we get our budget report and the administration says $16 million, that is what the administration think that the, the Aquatic Centre needs. So I don't want Tom to have to explain the lunacy of that vote at one o'clock in the morning last council meeting. Well, I could sit here and debate with you, Councillor Moran, but I won't. But I just want to be to be very clear that the centre will continue to be safe and continue to be able to be used by well, people well, that visit well, that centre. Because, because we don't want to continue ask. doing band-aid fixes. That's that's the whole thing that you Any have Any fix would be good. We, uh, that it is continually will be maintained and fixed, Councillor Moran. I'm going to move on, and I'm not going to debate this item. We'll save that for chamber. Um, we are going to go to our item 5.9. Grace um, is presenting on 2020 and 2021 quarter three financial report. <laughs> Opening up the floor to any questions or discussions to this item. If not, I'm going to move on. Uh, oh, Councillor Martin. Uh, just a few questions, um, if I may. Um, I, I just wonder um, if. Um, I could have explained to me in layman's terms the large sums that have helped uh, to reduce that uh, operating deficit. Uh, some of them I can follow clearly. I mean, uh, increase in uh, income. Thanks for the question through the chair. Yes, there's, there's a um, favourable movement in income across New Park Aquatic Centre and the commercial properties is sort of just tied back from the previous report. Um, discussed, which total um, about four and a half million. So um, that has 
increased significantly. Um, the other favourable, the most significant favourable movement has been that the transition costs to do with reshape have come in significantly lower than expected as well. So that was the redundancy reshaping package. That's exactly yep. right. Yeah, so that, that presented um, another just over $5 million savings. So, so those are probably the most two significant items. Um, there has been some other sort of um, savings generated through items that we would have um, previously budgeted for as operational but have moved into capital in um, in nature in the sense that we're still spending the money, it's just not operational um, in nature in that spend. That is so that's, we're still borrowing it, yes, um, absolutely, but it is a, it's a capital spend instead of an operational spend, which means we can capitalise it and, and we don't have to, it doesn't have to have that impact straight on the operating result. So, um, those values add up to or sort of just shy of three million. So, you know, that's where the bigger numbers are in terms of that shift from QF2 to QF3. Okay. And um, just for, uh, can you just take me through slowly? And I'm sorry to be dense about it. Um, paragraphs 28 and 29, are we actually in layman's terms? Uh, thank you, through the chair. So 28 is talking about um, the carry forward um, capital budgets. So at the time of preparing the 21-22 draft budget, we had an estimate in there of 21.64 um, capital projects that um, uh, wouldn't be completed by the 30 June and would be carried forward into 21-22. And during QF, and what we've done traditionally in QS is sort of continue to the revise that estimate. We haven't done that um, revision this time. We are anticipating that that carryover value is going to be less than the 21.6 that was in there. And the, um, uh, the infrastructure team are working hard to sort of deliver as much as they can still before the 30th of June. So we estimate that it will come down to something closer to 17.4 million instead of the 21.6 being carried over, but we haven't affected that in this um, QF3 um, because we'd just be simply replacing an estimate with an estimate. So the preference is then to um, bring you, once the actuals uh, are completed on the 30th of June, we know where these projects actually landed at the 30th of June, we will then um, bring the decision to council to say, we want to carry forward or we'll revise the carry forward amount and bring over what is actually needed to be carried forward into the 21-22 rather than just estimating it and estimating again and then estimating again. And, and uh, just on that subject, I can't remember which page, it might be 108 or 109, uh, they're the carry forwards in the quarter, aren't they? Uh, I can't see, I've got Uh, those are the ones that are actually being adjusted um, through QF. So those are the ones that I've um, talked about in terms of being um, moving from operational to capital. So Correct. I believe you're talking about the infrastructure program page. Is that yep. Right? yep. Um, so Thank those you. are those ones that are just shifting in terms of nature. Yep. And, um, on page 107, the operating projects, Main Street revitalisation. Project delivery to continue in 21-22. What's that? Uh, so there is a project of work um, which is being um, a, so there's a place working group that's been established internally. It's the roundtable discussions that have been established for the Main Street uh, precincts in terms of Hart Street, O'Connell and Melbourne Street. <laughs> oh, that's the master plan. <laughs> um, so those are the master plans kind of projects, but that is now kind of moved into a bit more of a sort of... Um, Place working cape round table. So that, discussion. that's the one that started out at 340,000 and it's down now to 200. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and at page 109, there's a reference to urgent work related to the bridges. Do we know what that is? A sort of design and urgent work bridges. Release urgent work provision 115,000. Design provision 92,000k offset by small increase in year two. Um, thank you for the question, but I think I have to defer that one to Clinton. He might know more of the specifics. Clinton. Uh, through the chair, um, it's really just a, a naming convention internally, councillor. Um, it's not urgent works, it's just uh, uh, we have a contingency allowance for should any work come up that's required on the bridge that is not considered within the, that annual budget, it gives us the ability to act on it immediately. Um, so that's what that budget is. Okay. 
Um, and at the last council meeting, um, I think it was proposed that the um, uh, the future fund would pay for the central market arcade um, redevelopment, but I see it's still at seventy three thousand dollars in QF three. Um, are we expecting any change in that? Uh, thank you for the question through the chair. No, not for this financial year. Um, so the the motion that spoke about the central market arcade funding was to affect from next financial year onwards. So not right. affect on this financial year, not affect QF3. Okay, well it's not enough to buy much for all, is it? Okay, thank you for that. Um, thank you for this update. It's um, very good to see you know, we're down to 18 million dollar deficit, which is less than half of what was projected. Um, regarding the debt position, the borrowings are, I think, at 42 mil from memory. Um, when do we think? I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I, I would be surprised if you're able to borrow enough and spend another 20 million dollars over the coming quarter. So when will there be clarity over that? Will we have, I'm just conscious of got a budget out to consultation at the moment and the most recent figures in this report actually, you know, carries through that and changes some of those and it's actually, the figures are better. Um, so I'm just, I'm just curious as to when you'll know whether or not you're actually borrowing another $20 million this year. Um, I can't, thank you for the question, sorry, through the chair. I can't give you absolute certainty on where we land on the 61 or whether it will be the 45 or 55. Um, um, I suppose we don't at this stage anticipate that it would be too much less than the 61, although that is a possibility based on, you know, um, the pattern of spending over the last few months if we had to project that out. But based on the on the forecast that's been provided in QF3, I mean, that's where we are anticipating to land around that 61. Um, what can happen in the last eight weeks of the year and whether we can actually continue to execute the QF and, and land where we thought we were going to land. But naturally, if we end up favourably, then yes, that will translate through to borrowings and we'll end up borrowing less. So, yeah, that, and that will translate through into next year's balances as well. That's really good, Chair. I suppose the flip side of that equation is if if our revenue does recover above what is expected, which is possibly 85%, I can't remember what we based it on the last budget. Um, if, if it does stay at that higher level, that would also result in fewer borrowings, yes. Thanks for the question through the chair. Yes, absolutely. If there any improvement on um, the operating surplus, whether that's through um, permanent cost savings or whether that's through uh, revenue improvement, that will be translated through the bottom line and that will uh, mean that we'll need to borrow less and then that will yeah, reduce the borrowings. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on this item? If not, I'm going to move on to 5.10. Um, Grace, you're here uh, for the next item as well for interest rate sensitivities. Any questions or discussions on this item? Um, just an observation. Uh, look, I thank the administration for the paper. I, I, I am surprised. Um, when a corporation enters into a borrowings um, uh, forecast, it generally asks questions about what inflation and interest rates might be in any scenario. And in an, this scenario, in the paper, we just assume a range limited to 1.35 to 2%, um, and we don't even acknowledge any other model, which is um, a bit disappointing, but not in this paper. Grace, would you like to answer that? Thanks for the question through the chair. Um, I do uh, take that as a yeah, good observation. It is um, um, an assumption that is built into the plan. An assumption is an assumption. You, you kind of have to sort of take it as a best educated guess. Um, however, um, there is a lot of information out in the market. It is some of the things that we are looking at around how we can um, look at kind of working off of better other kinds of assumptions and um, and <coughs> other products that are out there in terms of being able to kind of give us some better indication. Um, but these are in line with the state government 
sort of for the first few years and then and I guess for the sort of the last few years. Um, yeah, there are other models that we could adopt. Um, so in terms of looking at those different models, then sensitivity would be different um, in terms of the kinds of analysis that you'd be able to do and um, and we could um, present that a little bit differently, but um, in, the, in the way that the assumptions have been um, formed um, in this version of the plan, it is, it is based on those those state government assumptions and we've just kind of taken a simple up and down lift for the purpose of the sensitivity analysis this time around but it is something that we can look for because um, the assumptions in the plan are definitely sort of one of the varying factors and, and you know um, doing sensitivity analysis on those is definitely um, a, a way to test the robustness of them so we'll take that on board. Anyone else? Oh good. And Councillor? Just, um, just very briefly, at six, a one percent change would have X impact over ten years. Um, is is are you working on the assumption through you, Chair, that it's uh, twenty one, twenty two is becomes two point three five, and then that carries that extra percent carries through the whole whole life of the plan, and you're you're calculating that on the debt levels that you're expecting to have in those respective years. Is that? Uh, yes, that is. Thank you for the question through the chair. That's pretty much almost perfectly right, except I didn't apply it to the 21 22 because we have more certainty around that number right, next right. year. Um, okay. But it did apply it to 22 23 onwards, so onwards. the last life yep. of the plan. And yes, it is based on the projected level of borrowings that are in the plan um, in the revised version of the plan that went out for consultation. Um, so obviously, if the borrowings change, the income will change. Yep. So thank you. Thank you, members. No other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Grace. We've got uh, three items uh, that we have uh, an exclusion to the public uh, to consider in confidence. So we need an order to exclude um, for item 7.1. So could I have a mover? Thank you, Councillor Boomstay, Senator. Thank you, Councillor Canal. Would you like to speak to this? No? Those in go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Carry. Uh, uh, order for item 7.2. Thank you. Have a mover. Councillor Boomstay, Councillor Canal. Would you like to speak to it? No. Those uh, take it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Motion's carried. We've got order. Number 7.3. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Councillor Ambrose, today. Would you like to speak to it? Um, yes, I just want to uh, flag that we're very happy to consider this in confidence because other aspects of our commercial operations was considered earlier in the public agenda um, for the first time that I've been on the council. So I just really want to thank our administration for that excellent work separating those two. Um, it's a win for transparency. Um, and so I'm very happy that everything that could be considered publicly responsibly has now been considered publicly. Um, and uh, that's why I'm very happy to move that we go into confidence for, for this part of it. Thank you. Councillor Rooms today? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. We'll take it to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? Motion's carried. So those that are not involved with item 7.1, 7.2, 7.3 have nothing to hear.